we began two weeks ago addressing the statement, you can make an impact for Christ. I didn't know whether or not it was a question or a statement. I think it's a, a bold statement that you can make an impact for Christ, and we won't pose it as a question, can you make an impact for Christ? You can. You can, and you should, as a disciple of Jesus. And so we're taking the word impact, and each week looking at a different one of the, the principles taught to us by the first century church in the book of Acts, chapter 2. We've been looking at each one, and we're going to continue that this morning. But I'm going to invite you to go to Paul's letter to the church in Rome first. If you look at Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. Romans 12, 3 through 8. I'll give everybody a chance to find it. Romans 12, 3 through 8. I'm going to invite you to share this with me as a unison reading. Let's hear, see, and say God's word together, if you would. Romans 12, 3 through 8. Please join with me. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. That's not a bad directive, is it? Paul did have a way with words. Let's look at Acts 2, 44 and 45 to start with as we look in that section of the second chapter of Acts where we see how the church lived its life so that we might indeed be a biblically structured church. Second chapter of Acts 44 and 45. We looked at 43 last week. Luke writes, All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And then we're going to turn back just a few chapters to chapter 6 of Acts. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I say, I think it really delights the Lord to hear the sound of the pages of the Bible being turned. Verses 1 through 7, chapter 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from, um, from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. What else do we know about Stephen. He's the first martyr of the Christian church. He's the first one whose life was taken because he believed in Christ. He was stoned to death. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of who? A priest became obedient to the faith. Wow, that is great news. If you want to keep your scriptures open, both Acts 2 and 6, we're going to be working with that a little bit this morning. 
Let's pray right now, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we're given once again to come into this house and as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we might come to worship you, praise you, give you the glory due a holy God. And Lord, we come, we come as disciples, which means we're students, and we come eager to learn, to grow, to know what you would speak to your people this day through your word. And you speak a word to each one of us, Lord, and you meet us where we are. And we pray you would lovingly lead us to where you'd have us be in our spiritual journey as each of us seeks to grow to maturity in Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Friends, here are some actual excerpts from classified ad sections of several city newspapers. Do you ever look at the classified ads? No? You have something better to do? I didn't. Okay, so that's... But here are some, some actual ads. Listen to these. Listen to these, how, how people would respond. Are you illiterate? Write today for help. <laughs> Alteration shop. We do not tear your clothing with machinery. We do it carefully by hand. <laughs> Auto repair service. Try us once. You'll never go anywhere else again. Man wanted to work in dynamite factory. Must be willing to travel. <laughs> Stock up and save. Limit one per person. Girl wanted to assist magician in cutting off head illusion. Good salary and Blue Cross insurance. We will, we will oil your sewing machine and adjust tension in your home for one dollar. Man, honest, will take anything. Use cars. Why go anywhere else to be cheated? Come here first. Now, classified ads are looking for a response, right? They're looking for someone to respond and to f buy a product, fill a position, do a particular job, classified ads. The church is seeking people to respond to a variety of needs. It was looking 2,000 years ago for people to respond to a variety of needs, and the church is looking today for people to respond to a variety of needs. Last week we said that the foundation of the early church in making impact for Jesus Christ was devotion to the instruction of the word of God. The I in impact is instruction. We must know the word before we can make an impact for the Lord. And we learn that devoted disciples look for ways to receive the word, research the word, and respond to the word. We talked about that last week. We looked at the Berean believers in the book of Acts. And Paul was there and he was preaching to them. And they basically said to Paul, gee, we really like what you're saying now, you hang out for a while. We're going to go and check against the word of God to see if what you're saying is right. If it is, yeah, we'll follow. And that's an interesting thing. You know, I told you last week, we need to do the same. We need to take and verify if what is being taught, what is being, being presented is in accord with the word of God. If it's not in accord with the word of God, we have a responsibility to say so. And I suggested to you, I'm perfectly happy, actually, if what I bring to you from the pulpit or in any other teaching situation is not in accord with the word, you need to tell me. Like I said last week, hopefully not in the middle of the worship service. Maybe one-on-one -on -one might work nicely. But So we, that's the first thing, is we need to take and be instructed in the word. And... Part of our response to the word is the M for impact. It's be mobilized for ministry. Be mobilized for ministry. The beauty of Christianity is, friends, we are redeemed for a reason. We've been saved to serve. We're converted for a cause. You know, there is a reason we are in the Christian church. And this morning, we look at that second component of a Christian lifestyle that was in the early church. We are to be mobilized for ministry. So look again at Acts 2, 44, 45. Acts 2, 45. 
all the believers were together. I like that, by the way. How many Christians got together? All of them. Getting together in the body of Christ was not optional. It was expected. You're in the Christian community. You go to church. You're there. All the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. They were committed to each other, giving, ministering wherever they had the opportunity. So how did a problem present a possibility for the church? There's a good lesson in this morning's scripture that we need to look at. So we look back at Acts 6, 1 through 7. Acts 6, 1 through 7, between verses 1 and 7, Luke tells the story of a problem that ripped the church apart, had the potential to deal with a real blow, but instead of derailing the church, the problem propelled the church to more growth. What happened in Acts 6 takes place at the end of a period of severe persecution of the Christian church. This is a church that has gone through horrific persecution, you know, and they emerged from it stronger than ever. So, in seven brief verses, Luke describes the problem, gives a solution, and tells us the result. Very simple outline here, and we can follow it in the study guide page if you want to. And when we get to the end, we discover that more people are serving the Lord, more people being one to the Lord, the unity of the church has been restored. This problem really gave a potential for great, great result. So what's the problem? Look at Acts 6.1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, so the church is growing. The church is growing. The Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the Grecian Jews complain against the Hebraic Jews. Okay? This is the first recorded case of racial prejudice in the Christian church. And that's exactly what this was. You know, it's, it's what's happening in the Christian church. The church has grown so fast, it's outstripped its leadership. It's outstripped its ability to minister to one another. And in the beginning, the disciples, their helpers, could easily keep everyone in a congregation. You know? Thousands join the movement. It's inevitable some people or groups of people fall through the cracks. We don't like it when people fall through the cracks. People fall through the cracks in the church today. And we need to do all we can to keep that from happening. But it was happening 2,000 years ago. Judaism, before Christianity, had a system to take and distribute food to its poor. They looked after their poor and their needy. And... So that was not uncommon to Jews. They knew about that. The early church in Jerusalem was a poor church, had very little in financial resource, but they shared their possessions with the needy. But the church is growing, number of people coming in, and the number of widows dependent on relief became larger as well. Because when we read this, we say, the Grecian Jews are arguing with the Hebraic Jews because the widows aren't being fed. Okay. I mean, it doesn't track with us in today's culture. The problem stemmed from the fact that although the early church was entirely Jewish, it was made up of two different groups of Jews. You had the Hebraic Jews. They're Christian converts who spoke Hebrew, more likely Aramaic, as their pri primary language, They'd been born, they'd been raised in Israel, native to the land, knew the customs of Palestinian Judaism entirely, and they brought their extensive Israelite Jewish culture into the church. Contrast, Grecian Jews, Christian converts, spoke Greek as a primary language. They'd been born, raised outside of Israel, when they came to Christ, they brought their Greek-speaking culture with them into the church. So you had two very disparate cultures, languages, coming into the congregation in Jerusalem. But they all were Jews. They probably looked a bit differently from each other, certainly acted differently, sounded differently, Hebrew-speaking 
Jewish Christians, from Grecian-speaking Jewish Christians, this recipe for trouble. You put that into the pot and mix it up, and as long as things were going well, differences were ignored. But the Jerusalem church eventually had problems in the daily distribution of food. You've got widows, Grecian, Hebraic, and one group is being ignored in the service of the food for the widows. And it just happens to be that it's a group that's identified with one of those ethnic group, uh, cultures, the Grecian. The Grecian. Hebrew-speaking Jewish Christian widows were being favored over the Greek-speaking Jewish Christian widows. Now, it's easy to dismiss as a minor problem, but it wasn't. Because if you're a Greek-speaking widow in the Jerusalem Christian church, it's a big deal. Why? Very basic reason. What? You're not being fed. You're not being fed. You know, in that culture at that time, if you didn't have a husband or you didn't have male relatives, brothers, you didn't have someone to help support you and to feed you, and particularly if you're aged, you went hungry. The church stepped in to feed the people who were going hungry. So that's a serious problem that demanded great attention. Churches routinely split over issues less important. So how should the church tackle a problem like this? Uh, if it were us, if it were our problem today here in Menden, we would appoint a food distribution committee to do a year-long study have the study be brought back to the elders on the session so they might consider it and do further investigation into the issue. Um, you, don't have the, you don't have the grace of having time to do that. You know, when I say new churches, churches split, churches begin, I could see we might start a new church. We would call it the First Jewish Christian Greek-speaking Church of Jerusalem. Let's just blend it all together. So that's the problem, kind of very clear presented by Luke. So what was the solution? Look at verses 2 to 6 in the scripture. This is outlined so beautifully for us. You know, they tell us how the early church confronted the problem. They didn't ignore it, didn't farm it out somewhere else. They confronted it. A church confronted its problem. Solution involved a four-step process. First, they set priorities. They set priorities. You know, there's this immediate response. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together. So the 12 apostles got the disciples together, which is the church. Second, there's a clear statement of the priority. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, that's what the apostles said. Listen to that again. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now that has bothered me as long as I've been reading the Bible. It, doesn't, it's, it had an air of arrogance, sort of like we're better than someone else. Were they better? No. They just had a different calling. They had a different ministry. That was their calling. You know, to share the word of God, to preach, to teach. You know, and I can easily imagine certain people in the church saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if the apostles went out there and served the tables? Wouldn't it be great if the leaders of the church role modeled for the rest of the congregation what this should be? I could see the people saying, you know, that, that would send a powerful message to all the Christians in the church that this is a good thing because the apostles are doing it. They're showing us how to wait tables and give people food. You know, what's the apostles just roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty? You know, that would be a healing way to bring the two groups together, wouldn't it? Let the church leaders do it. So what could be better than for the leaders to set the pace in personally solving the problem? It's so easy and so tempting, and friends, it would have been so wrong. It would have been so wrong. It would actually cause the apostles to disobey the will of God. That's if they had been serving the table. They understood that God had called them to the ministry of the word and to prayer, 
And anything that took them away from their ministry, their calling, that priority, no matter how good or noble or necessary it might seem, was a diversion from their God-given work. And so what I used to read as a very harsh thing, it's not appropriate for us to take away tables. You know, we've got other things to do that are important. That's true. They do. They do. You know, in any church, there are many tasks that need to be done. And it's tempting to say to the leadership, do a little of everything. How does that work when you do a, everybody does a little of everything? Nothing gets, nothing done, gets done or it does nothing gets done well. You know, that, you know, and that can lead to spiritual disaster. When the leaders do a little of everything, they end up doing a whole lot of nothing. Okay? Because you're not concentrating your effort, not giving all of your skill and gift. So, step one, setting priorities. That's the first step. Step two, make a plan. Churches are good at that, right? Look at verses three and four. You know, it's all well and good for the apostles to be high-minded about their calling, but we've still got a group of hungry widows on our hands, need to be cared for. What are we going to do about them? Because if the, if the widows aren't fed... They won't be in any mood to listen to the apostles preaching, will they? I mean, so what the apostles say is our priority, and this is the ministry we have to do, teaching and preaching. People are sitting there hungry. They're not too interested in listening to the word being proclaimed. How many of you ate something before you came to church this morning? How many of you would probably not be as comfortable if you'd had nothing before you came? So, so you know, they're not going to be in the mood to listen. So they need a plan to handle the problem. Now, notice it begins with congregational involvement. It's congregational involvement. Brothers, choose seven men from among you. Now, brothers being the congregation. I'm sure there were sisters there too. But it continues with a statement of qualification. So there's congregational involvement. Choose seven from among you. Statement of qualification, what? They're known to be full of the spirit and wisdom then there's a commitment to delegation. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And finally, there's a restatement of their own priorities because we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So rather than issuing an edict from on high, the apostles say to the congregation, you choose those that will serve the widows. We want spiritually mature people who you know, immediately have the respect of the church because they're known to be spiritually mature. Verse 5 gives us step 3. Find the right people. Find the right people. Luke tells us that this proposal won how much approval? Unanimous approval. Everyone thought that's a great idea. This proposal pleased the whole group. Here's a list of the seven men they chose. Stephen, a man full of faith. The Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. Um, when you look at that list of seven names, what do they have in common? I knew that we would all know that, right? They're actually all Greek names. They're all Greek names. Now, what group of widows was it that wasn't getting fed? The Greek widows, the Greek-speaking widows weren't being fed. They set up a system with seven men in the church to take and make sure that they're going to be fed. And all of these are Greek names. Hmm. You see something going on here? They knew the widows. They would have known them. Um, they have the trust of the Greek-speaking part of the church. You know? And they would know how to handle problems that might arise in that part of the church community. Now, does it say they were only to feed just the Greek widows? No, it doesn't say you seven go and just give your attention to that group. All seven are Greek. They're to see that all the widows get fed. So the people coming from the section that had been discriminated against are going to make sure all are cared for. It's a very, very beautiful way of addressing this. The final step is found in verse 6. Commission the workers. We're going to commission the workers. After the congregation selected the seven men, 
they were presented to the apostles who laid their hands on them and prayed for them. Why is that important? Why would that be important? How about if you're a Hebrew-speaking Jewish Christian? The 12 apostles laid their hands on them and prayed for them. Let them... Yeah, they have, you have the full backing of the 12 apostles to this decision, who all happen to be Greek, that they are all one in the congregation. And that's a very powerful image that they give. That the apostles, which by the way, how many of them were Greek speaking? They spoke Greek in the marketplace, but how many of them were native Greek speakers? None. They were none. And yet they put their hands on these Greek-speaking men, prayed for them, ordained them to office. And so you have a beautiful witness of 12 Jews who are Hebraic laying their hands on seven Greek Jews and ordaining them to an office to care for Greek and Hebraic widows. So this is how the church addressed its problem. That's how they dealt with it. You know, it assures the Greek-speaking widows that their concern is taken seriously, their needs will be met. It tells the congregation that the problem's been dealt with openly, honestly, and quickly. It wasn't allowed to fester in the church. There's all kinds of good lessons for the church to learn in this passage. We just pay attention to it. So what's the result? Verse 7. Verse 7 brings an end to this episode from the early church. Notice first, there is, because of this, new receptivity to the message of the gospel. Do you see that? So the word of God spread. Second, there are new converts. Number of disciples in Jerusalem spread rapidly. And third, there were conversions in high places. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Think about that. The priests serving in the temple in Jerusalem accepting Christ as the Messiah. Wow. That is exciting. A problem that threatened to divide the church offered a possibility to propel the church to greater growth because of how it was handled. So let's look at some life applications from this text. First, very simple thing. Friends, keep the main thing the main thing. You know, keep your eye on the ball. The apostles understood their primary calling, so they refused to become personally involved in the feeding program. They understood their calling, their main thing. Sometimes leaders need to say no to the good so they can say yes to the best. It might have been okay if the apostles started serving the widows, but it wasn't the best for the church. And so they had to say no to get to the yes. There are thousands of pressures that pull us away from our core concerns, every one of us in this room this morning. So I want to challenge you, what's your calling? You all have a calling. You all have a gifting, every one of you. How has God gifted you? Keep the main thing the main thing. What is your gift? That's what you bring to the fore. That's what you return to the Lord in service to the church. You know, next, how many of you can do everything? How many of you try to do everything? Yeah. How many of you succeed at doing everything? No one can do everything. No one can do everything. You know, we need to understand that in the church. The apostles couldn't do their work and also do the feeding of the widows. The elders can't do it all. The deacons can't do it all. The pastor can't do it all. There are hundreds of things that need to be done in a congregation. Hundreds of willing hands are needed. I can preach, I can teach, I can write, I can hopefully work with the elders and the deacons, lead staff, meet with people, do counseling, pray for the hurting, visit the sick, attend some meetings, cast a vision for the future, do some other things. But no matter what I do, I can't preach and right now be watching the little ones in the nursery. Somebody else has that calling. That's their calling. You know, that's 
we need to understand our work that we're to do. I can't preach or teach and play the piano when you don't want me to. But heaven, heaven forbid I sing a solo for you. So, I mean, everyone has gifts. Every, and these gifts come forward in the life of our church. You know, it's not enough to just discover or develop your spiritual gift. Gifts are to be used. And if you're not using your gifts in the service of Christ in the church, then you're, quite frankly, abusing them. They are, you are gifted for a reason. You've been gifted to serve. And the third implication is this, that while no one can do everything, everyone can do something. Everyone. You know, when Jim got up here earlier and was asking you to commit to come and help with the spaghetti dinner in another two weeks. You know, friends, that's, that's a major program we do to raise funds for Ben and Casa. We are one of the three founding churches of Ben and Casa. We were the original one, one of three in the incorporation of that. They're housed in our old parsonage. It's our ministry. It's our ministry. It's our community. And so we raise funds so that they can take and provide terminal care service to folks. And they've touched the life of this church a number of times through providing care for those who are part of our extended family. And so, Jim, have you got just one job on the board, or are there a variety of different types of jobs? I thought there was. And so there's a lot of different kinds of jobs, which means that there's a job that will meet your skill set. There's something you can do. There's something you can do. So everyone can do something. And I really pray that you will give your attention to that board, his prop, his visual prop he used. Now, I pointed out, I said, I think we only have six card tables listed on the board right now, and we need like 30 or 40 card tables to set this place up as an Italian cafe. We, I mean, if you've not participated in this or come to it before, this is really a wonderful event. Um, so I guess this is just one simple way of saying for that event, there are places for everyone to serve. And we started by talking about classified ads. Jim was our classified ad this morning, and we appreciate that. So God's looking for workers. You're not just along for the ride. You've been gifted. You've been saved to serve. And so we're here to serve. You have a calling. Now, the only question now is whether you will use your gifts and answer your calling. That's the question the scripture begs this morning. Will you use your gifts and answer your calling? So, men in church, are you ready to be mobilized for ministry? Because if you are, you will indeed make an impact for Jesus Christ. We are mobilized for ministry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for once again sharing your word as we open the covers of the book. And gosh, Lord, if we would just take time to spend in your word, there's so much we would learn, so much the church would learn in how we're to live our life together and to take and serve one another and the world in Christ's name. So Lord, thank you for this morning pointing out some basic principles that we might overlook that when we are in the fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ, how you call us to live together and to share together, to care for one another. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.